Hello, everyone, and welcome to Strat Originals. Today, we are in for a treat. We have Adrian Stevens with us, and Adrian is a five-time president and CEO of both private companies and Fortune 200 divisions of publicly held companies. But the big story, she's a badass. What does a badass really mean? Well, you're going to hear a story about why we call her a badass. We have some fun with that word. But she's also a YPO member, a board director. She's a coach, a speaker, a wife, very proud mama. And uh, we're so excited to have Adrian here and hear her story. So welcome to Strat Originals, Adrian. Thanks so much, Ellen. It's a pleasure to be here. So we're going to get started at the beginning. So you've done a lot of things in non-traditional spaces. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Where did that your story start? Well, I mean, it started growing up downtown Detroit with a military dad who treated me as his son. He only had girls. So I was the oldest and, uh, you know, he pushed me. He put me in front of things that he knew I could do and made me do. And um, it really shaped my character of really just being fearless and optimistic and knowing that I can make things happen if I put my mind to it. So you experienced the military without being in the military? Is that what you said? Correct. Yeah. My dad, you know, when I would get in trouble, he'd be like, drop and give me 20. And, uh, <laughs> you know, in terms of push-ups. Yes. And, um, you know, well, so that for me, I mean, it just, it was a very disciplined environment in that regard. I mean, all the way around. It wasn't the easiest environment whatsoever. Uh, but, you know, I got through it and it made me stronger and it's just part of who I am. And I didn't really appreciate it at the time, but now as an adult, you know, I look back and it's part of who I am. And um, I'm thankful for all of those elements and experiences that I had. Excellent. So um, you were a pilot, yeah. Very rare right thing. Did that also start out from your dad? Was that an influence? Yeah. Your dad as well? yeah. So uh, my dad was a pilot and he taught me how to fly. So, you know, I was at the airport on the weekends as a young child and always exposed, you know, to aviation. And then one day I asked the question, so dad, you know, how do you know where you're going? Do you just go to like the fifth cloud and turn right? And that started my uh, ground school 24-7, every day of the week, it seemed like. Um, when I was in high school, I really didn't go to any football games or things like that because he had me out at the airport uh, flying. And, um, you know, being so young and starting to fly at 15 years old and you know, I did my long cross country from Pontiac, Michigan to Long Beach, California. And um, but he made sure that I knew what I was doing because, you know, I was his daughter. And if anything happened to me, of course, it would be devastating for him and my mother. And so, uh, you know, that really established a foundation for me of discipline and understanding process and confidence and dealing with uncertainty and uh, you know again some some great experiences you know i went to college as a pilot and a flight instructor i became a commercial pilot um, the guys that i went to flight school with i still have relationships with today and i'm very proud of that and um you know i kind of feel my claim to fame is that I was a flight instructor for one of the Blue Angels to start with. And so, you know, that's that's kind of cool. Of course, you know, that's the flight instructor in me, the mama bear in me. And, um, you know, so cool. just an element, an element of my life that just makes me who I am. Interesting. So you don't just turn right at cloud number five. That's what you're saying. No. That's how it works. OK, <laughs> just want to make sure that. I, I've always marveled at pilots because the responsibility that that a pilot has for hundreds of passengers. I'm, you know, yeah. I'm so cautious when I'm driving a car with four people. I can't imagine what that responsibility is like. And how did you adapt to that that ultimate responsibility of leadership of of taking these people? Like, was that something that was real for you when you were flying commercially? Yeah, you know, I. Um... 
again, it gets back to the fundamentals and having process and understanding the checklist and, you know, the systems of the aircraft and how they operate. And, you know, you're, you're just, your training is so critical. And, you know, that comment I made about the cloud just goes to show how young I was and how inquisitive I was, you know, when I was asking those questions and, you know, that for my dad was like a dream come true, looking for that opening to, you know, set me up in an industry that he was so passionate about and that I became so passionate about. Now, one of the things that you're all about is female empowerment because you've essentially lived, lived the other side and, yeah. uh, Female pilots, especially a few years ago, were pretty rare. Any stories about yeah. your world and showing up on that first day going, look at me? And yeah, there's so many stories, right? I mean, back when I was flying, they didn't, they didn't even have uniforms for women. So, you know, I was having to tailor, you know, men's shirts and, and such. Um, my first day at college was also... Uh, really quite incredible. I was in a flight program and uh, the professor in one of my classes, which happened to be an aircraft lab class, which took place in a hangar at the airport, looked at me, you know, and I was the only girl in the, in the class. And he said, you know, Adrian, um, we don't have women in these programs. And so we don't even have a bathroom here at the airport. So you know, you should just leave. And, you know, I was really taken aback by that. And what I said to him after the class was like, look, I paid for this class and, you know, I really want to be here. And what he was doing, which I realize now was really toughening me up, making sure I had the thick skin to deal in this male dominated environment. And my response to it was, you know, I knew I had to win him over and I knew I needed to understand what I was doing and to do better and, um, you know, really stand out for my work ethic and my knowledge. And so, you know, I would just show up, you know, whenever I could with him to get extra training and extra um, education. And if I had questions about it. I would, I would fly, he lived on an airport, and I would fly and go land at the airport, I would taxi up to his house, I'd knock on the door, and I'd be like, hey, can you help me with this? And he'd look at me and just roll his eyes, and he'd be like, what are you doing here? So I, I wanted him to know that I was serious about it, and I was, I was going to work for it. I was putting the work in. I love it. And I want to talk about your career in a second, but I want, there's one other thing that's kind of unique and why we call you the badass CEO is you were a power lifter, a champion power lifter. <laughs> yeah. uh, so pilot, woman, power lifter, worked in armored vehicle. I mean, so tell me about the power lifter thing, because that's fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, I was an athlete when I was younger and, um, you know, strength training became an important part of getting better. At, and I was, you know, I ran track and field and um, then I had a knee injury. So I started tra strength training and it just so happened that I was very, very strong with all of those push-ups and other things that my dad literally forced me to do. You know, I had, I had a very solid uh, structure. And so I started powerlifting and I, you know, one thing led to another. I, I won a local competition, a regional state, and then on a national level. And then I went ahead and set four American records. And, uh, you know, to this day, I love lifting weights. I think lifting weights is one of the best things that you can do for your body and for your mind. And especially as you get older. And so, you know, huge advocate of health and wellness. And even today, I still consider myself to be an athlete. So, you know, what's uh, beautiful about that, right? We talk about leadership is always servant leadership, but people are afraid of you. So that's kind of cool too, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's nothing I won't say no to. You know, I'm always willing to try. And um, although jumping out of an airplane would not be something I'd want to do. I mean, why would you want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? But, um, 
you know, in general, I, I really, I'm a go for it person and I want to live life and uh, just do the best I can, I can and have experiences. You know, I think, and that's the other thing that I think that leaders appreciate is when you have good spirit and it's sincere and authentic, uh, all the other things that you have skills at are appreciated even more because you have this great humanity. How did that come about? Because typically military and empathy don't go together. And how did you find that balance? Yeah, well, my mom was the perfect balance there because she was so um, compassionate and loving and funny and she liked to party and she had friends and, you know, so she really made my dad's serious rough edges, you know, that much softer. So I feel like I got the best of both of them. And also having learned from my dad, I also learned what I didn't want to be. Right. And so I, I really applied myself in treating people the way that I would want to be treated. And so as a flight instructor, I knew how important it was to give those positive affirmations and to build people up and to build their confidence. And, you know, for any mistake they made in the airplane, it was really a lesson. And so, you know, for five attaboys, if there's one mistake, there's five attaboys to just you know, help people build their confidence and learn and not look at it as a failure, but more as, you know, a lesson. And those are the things they're going to remember the most rather than, you know, things that they would take for granted. So, so yeah. Being, always being the, probably the only female in the room, you also were in the armored vehicle business. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so as a pilot, that's one thing. As a power lifter, that's another thing. Tell me about that that experience. That had to be really interesting with a lot of good stories. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was an incredible experience. After I decided to stop flying for a living, I moved to the business side of aviation and started working for BF Goodrich Aerospace in business development. And BF Goodrich moved on to become Goodrich corporation and then was sold to L3 Technologies. And I was a president there um, and was with the company for 16 years. Wow. From there, um, I really, I was on the road 70% of the time. Um, our daughter at the time was young, 12 years old. She's our only child. And I wasn't home enough. I wasn't present for her like I should be. And that was really, you know, being a parent and setting a good example and a role model and being present for your kids is your most important responsibility. And I realized that. And so I looked for an opportunity that was more local. And that set me on a path of moving to different industries outside of aviation. And it was really just because of the proximity of where I lived and the lack of aviation opportunities in that community mm -hmm. and the desire to be grounded and, and be closer to home. And so I left aviation. I went on to run a distribution company, another manufacturing firm, and then I was recruited to run this Israeli company Israeli-owned company that manufactured ceramic composite armor for tactical wheeled vehicles. And um, having had a lot of experience with calling on customers in the military before and government like Lockheed Martin and, and such, um, and working with various air forces around the world, um, you know, I, I had a lot of global experience and I'm technically oriented also you know, just my foundation and understanding of technology and really the passion that I have for it because, you know, life can improve so much with technology and evolving technologies are so cool. Mm -hmm. And so I was hired to run this Israeli company and I, our company operated under a special security agreement and we would basically take a an armor or we would take a tactical wheeled vehicle from a prime or 
you know, a vehicle that would go to the U.S. Army and we would armor it up. And that opportunity then led me to another promotion with that same business where they gave me responsibility for manufacturing of carbon fiber com components for high performance vehicles. And so like with that company, we took a couple hundred pounds out of, Chevy, out of a Chevy Corvette. And, um, you know, so it's just been my career has been rounded by very interesting, unique experiences, um, industries that, you know, aren't, aren't typical, yeah. right? And um, it's just been so exciting for me to meet so many different people and have all these different, you know, interactions with different cultures. And it gets back to the core for me of what I believe about business and that's business is about people. And so when you can understand people and listen and share with them the strategy of a business and engage them and motivate them and bring them in, you know, they want to contribute and do their best. And with that, a business grows. And so, you know, um, that's really my MO. I don't, I feel that leadership is universal. Um, you know, it's about people and caring about them and demonstrating empathy and compassion, but also driving toward results. Interesting that you you talked about global and I've had some experience with Israel and Japan and China. I agree with you 100 percent. Leadership is universal. But is there a subtlety around how you deal with people from different cultures? Have you experienced the things you have to adapt to based on the countries you're dealing with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what's so important, not only internationally, but I think domestically as well, is listening and, you know, caring about people and learning who they are and being willing to see things from their perspectives. And when you can do that, then you can communicate better with them in their language from the way that they will see things and with that you're able to get more things done you can accomplish more and it's a more collaborative environment and a friendlier environment and um you know so that that's really a pleasure for me is to you know meet and work with people from all over um i love working with products and uh, services and and as a servant leader, really serving others and helping them uh, to become their best. Now you also love big challenges, right? You your entire life, starting with your dad pushing you there, was about challenges and meeting new challenges. Yeah. Not everybody's built that way, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So did did you find that your mindset developed, obviously starting with your dad? but developed over time with the powerlifting and all the different jobs. Tell me about how you got to that place where you had really good resilience, but yet that empathy and love that your mom taught you uh, were able to extract that and do it in business. What's that balance like inside the, the boardroom? Yeah, well, I'm a very curious individual. And so, you know, I'm interested in people, I'm interested in technology and business and markets. And so being curious, you know, I like to learn and I believe, and this really goes to and speaks to all the different industries I've been in, you know, going from being a commercial pilot to working in business into management from one industry to the next, um, you know, when I put my mind to something, I feel like I can, can accomplish anything and, and I'm not afraid to ask for help. And, um, so, you know, the mindset matters. It comes from, it comes from that. And, um, you know, just, I, I've loved the opportunity of challenges to reinvent businesses and to, you know, reignite and make changes to strategy to help a business accelerate and to grow. And I feel so strongly about change and transformation, not change for change's sake, but, 
you know, the world around us is constantly changing and technology is changing. So you can either adapt and move with it and continue to grow and build, or you can remain stagnant and, and at some point it's going to become obsolete. You know, we're in kind of a cataclysmic stage right now with AI, right? And what's going to happen with that. And so do you have any perspectives? And I know it's kind of early stages on, you know, if you're in a, a next business and, you know, you know, impossible to know what role AI would play, but what are your thoughts? Because change, a, AI is about change, right? Yeah. Things are going to change. Any thoughts on, you know, if you were walking in the business tomorrow, the things that you would help people think about? in this new world that we're about to embark into? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, AI is all about building data and it's, you know, recognizing behaviors and everything we do, you know, has to do with our phone these days and everything is being captured, you know, with that type of type of instrument. And so, you know, my one of my most recent assignments was running a company, a health technology company. And we developed a product that used artificial intelligence and machine learning to help you manage your health better, to reduce stress. It would be able to recognize when you're starting to feel stress and the steps you should take to you know, return back to a calm state. And so AI can be very dangerous as we all understand from the news and, and things like that. But, you know, there's also AI for, for good, for mm -hmm. to be used for good that can help companies and understand, you know, how they're operating better with business intelligence, data analytics, and, um, you know, help you to continue to grow and secure the future, not only for the business, but of course, for the employees and um, the owners. Interesting. And so if you walked into a new business tomorrow, a new CEO opportunity, what would you do in the first couple of weeks? What would be the first things that you'd think about uh, when you were in that chair for the first time? Because you've done it a few times already. Yeah, yeah, and I'm a I'm a strong believer of your first 100-day plan, right? And and really for me those days are all about building relationships and you know, understanding who the team is and how I can support them and help them overcome hurdles that they're dealing with, understand the market and the customer and where the opportunities are, where the gaps are that need to be addressed. And so, you know, I'm not one to just come in and and those first 100 days, I, I'm really observing, learning, listening, and working on building trust with people. Interesting. And, and any, any cool stories about people who you had to win over when you walked into a business that, you know, there's always one executive going, that should have been my job. Did you ever have that experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a few, but one stands out. And it's really how my career first started. Um, when I was, when I made the decision that I wanted to leave flying airplanes for a living and instead get on the business side of aviation, um, I started interviewing with Goodrich. And, uh, you know, that for me, not only was I making a transition and transforming, you know, my career, I, uh, you know, needed to win people over because from their perspective, you know, I didn't have sales experience. I didn't have, you know, I came up as a pilot. So yeah, I knew how to operate the equipment, but from a business perspective, you know, I hadn't been working in a business, even though I did earn a business degree while in, while in college. So with Goodrich, I ended up having 13 interviews for this, for this one sales job. And the guy I was interviewing with, he had me interview with not only other managers, but directors, VPs, and also the president of the company. There were 13 interviews. <laughs> and at the end of at the end of all of that, I got a call that said, well, you know, um, you don't have enough sales experience. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to pass. And, 
you know, I, that was hard for me to, to really take after meeting all of those people. And so I thought about it once we got off the phone and I, I decided to call him and say, ask him if I could just have, you know, a few minutes to meet with him, to learn from his perspective, what I needed to do so that I could, you know, officially make that jump, you know, into the business side of aviation. So he said, sure. So we met in the lobby and for every reason why he said I couldn't, I had a reason why I could. And I knew in my heart that there was no way that he was going to put me in front of the president and the executive leadership team at that company if he didn't believe that I had what it took to be successful. And so, you know, I left there that day just feeling really proud of myself, knowing like I gave it everything that I could. And if at that point they didn't hire me, well, it was their loss. That's really how I looked at it. And so it wasn't that much longer, you know, a couple hours later, I got a phone call from the VP of the organization who offered me the job for $30,000. And it was like, oh my God. I mean, that was a lot more money, 20% more than I was making flying airplanes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, that set me on this path. And, um, you know, fr from there, I just feel like, you know, being friendly, being approachable, being authentic and warm, you know, <laughs> being yourself just yeah. goes, a goes a long way. And, this is a perfect example of really, you know, believing in who you are and your capabilities. And there's only upside for trying. You're always going to learn something. You know, what we always joke about is, you know, be yourself. Everybody else is taken. Right. So at the end, yeah. of the day, but what, you know, the lesson that is so great for anybody, you know, watching this, this podcast is, you know, a no is not a no. Right. So you take it as a no and you just, you you took you did the ultimate sales thing was he said no and now my selling begins yeah absolutely did, right and then so absolutely. you prove that you could sell because you didn't take no for an answer and and i'm sure that's that's such a great lesson for young folks today young young female executives to understand that people say no and sometimes they don't have all the information and you're just giving them more information so that's such a great great lesson Thank you. For I have Thank a you. I have a question that um I want you to think back, you know, with all that you've accomplished in your career today and in your life and the people that love you, what advice would you give that younger female in your life that said, you know, at 15 or 17 gone, what would you tell her knowing what you know now? Besides being true to yourself and yeah. really what you be, who you are, that it's all gonna work out. It's all going to be okay. I mean, there's, there's some times that are, you know, really tough, really dark times where you feel alone, you feel like the world is against you. And if you're true to yourself and, you know, you just continue to move forward, it's, it's all going to be okay. And, um, you know, that can alleviate so much stress and worry and just having that faith and, um, Knowing that who you are is has meaning and is special and your uniqueness, we're all different for a reason. 100%. And your uniqueness and what you bring to the table um, sets you apart. That's it's just great advice because it is such a you know very anxious world, right? Isn't it? And so, and those of us who've been through a little, a few bumps and bruises, we know that that's part of the human condition, isn't it? Well, and we have always, especially when you're younger, we're trying so hard to please everybody else. Yeah. I mean, for me in particular, I was always looking for that affirmation from my father. And when he wasn't around, I transferred that to other people wanting their affirmation instead of really looking at myself and, and recognizing I got to please me before I can, I can please others. And so, you know, it's crazy what happens to you when you're in your fifties, right? Well, <laughs> you, it, like, it, you realize it, all this. <laughs> some of us a little older, uh, but the, um, the, the reality is it, it's amazing how you see, or at least from the outside, see the shaping of, 
of the product of Adrian. It was really interesting when you go back to the beginning and the influences of your mom and your dad and all the jobs and the powerlifting and stuff like that. And how you end up as a, a servant leader, when I asked you what you do in the first hundred days, there wasn't a process question in there. And I know that's what you do. You're a business optimization expert as well. But you look at it and say, well, the people doing the job are the people. I've got to focus on the folks that I'm going to build trust with. And that, to me, was the illustration of what kind of leader you will be in the next in the next important gig in your life, whatever that chooses to be for you, uh, because yeah. you're focusing on the right thing. And that's just so cool. I just wanted to congratulate you for that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have one last question for you, and it's a fun one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you now have your own late night talk show. Living or not living, who would be your first guest? Wow, I mean, that is a, um, there's so many people, right? There's so many interesting I'm off people. the table. You can't have me as your first guest. <laughs> Let's be very clear right. on that. I'm off the table. Well... You know, having just visited Graceland with my daughter, I would want to meet Elvis. You know, the king of rock and roll, the guy who like started it all, the the person who grew up in an era where there wasn't inclusion. Mm. You know, he crossed bridges for so many people. He served our country. He was there when everything was changing when, as it relates to just, you know, music and integration and, you know, politics and Vegas. And I just, I can't imagine all these amazing, amazing stories and, you know, just the confidence that he had, the ideas that he had, the love for his parents that he had, and the loyalty he had to his upbringing and, um, you know, the people in his life that he loved and and just really the kick-ass music that he made, yeah. you know? I mean, I just think that would be a very fascinating conversation. So he's mm -hmm. one of many, but he's the one that comes to mind, you know, right out of the gate. Well, you know, he's um, in a lot of ways, he was a trailblazer, right? And yeah, that, uh, you know, there are parallels in your lives as well that you yeah. took in some things that most, you know, females don't dive into. And we hope in the future, it's not even a question anymore. It's just, yeah, he's the best talent to do the job. And he was, he, he you know, uh, he, he was unique. And uh, it's, what a great choice. He would have been a great choice. It'd be great to have him yeah. back. I mean, I could name off so many others right now, but um, he's somebody who just kind of comes top to mind. Awesome. And uh, yeah, so thank it, you. This was such a pleasure to uh, spend a half hour with you. Um, uh, we look forward to more conversations because you'll be having more conversations with people out there on the social media world. We look forward yeah. to that. Adrian, it was such a pleasure to to get to know you and to share your story with uh with our audience and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you so much. This was a pleasure and a privilege for me, Alan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.